Hello there, you join me in the tracking station where I'm currently checking out the old space junk situation, spade you sitch if you will, because you may recall I accidentally left a spent upper stage in orbit during the construction of my Minmus space station after forgetting to add a probe core and reaction wheel to it. But to my dismay, when I opened the tracking station, there were actually quite a few bits of debris littering my save files. So I thought this will never do, we need to clean up space. Uh, we could literally just click the terminate button in the tracking station, that just destroys the vessels, but where's the fun in that, right? We're going to use an SSTO to clean up low carbon orbit. Now, admittedly, I was kind of surprised by the number of spent upper stages left in low carbon orbit because, you know, I... I usually try and detach them when they're on a suborbital trajectory so that they just get swept up in Kerbin's atmosphere and get destroyed. Such as this one, it is on a suborbital trajectory, but only just right, a 68 kilometer, well I guess actually 69 kilometer perigee versus a 79 kilometer apogee. So uh, I started to de do the deorbit process, but then I started getting really bored because this is actually going to take ages, but organically, if I were to just walk away from the PC and just let this thing do its thing, it would naturally decay in its orbit. So I felt for this particular piece of space junk, we could just terminate it in the tracking station and have a guilt-free conscience. We shouldn't have to do that for this next spent upper stage because if we just check out its orbital statistics to the top left of the screen, we can see we've got a perigee of about 45 kilometers, so much lower. So we should be able to do this, deal with this one ourselves uh, in a much more you know time-friendly manner. So I'm just going to speed the footage up just so we can watch those orange flames lap up the side of the vessel as it careers down back to the surface of Kerbin. And it looks like a fairing base plate survived not only the re-entry, but splashdowns. Hey, we can recover the vessel, save us a bit of cash. Now the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed a couple of other debris objects in the tracking station, apart from the one we're going to be deorbiting ourselves in this mission in low carbon orbit, but those are like glitched debris, like they were on a faster than light trajectory out of the solar system. So I don't know what they were, they might have been something that crashed into the surface of something and then just got catapulted elsewhere. I'm not really sure what they were, but I just terminated them because... You know, I didn't actually d d uh, detach them whilst going faster than light, so I don't really know how they got there. So anyway, here I am constructing the vehicle. I decided to make it an SSTO because I've not done an SSTO in a while, right? During the whole KSP2 year. I didn't really do any SSTOs because they just don't really work as well in that game as they do in this game. I mean, they do work, but I just didn't like how they looked because you needed to use those ugly hydrogen tanks. So make it a classic, a classic Mark II fuselage style SSTO here. Um, I know this is kind of like a small scope mission, right? Like I'm not doing a really, really difficult challenge or complicated mission, or indeed continuing on with my uh, colonization project of establishing a sustainable colony on the surface of Minmus that can then, you know, send missions to further, uh, further out into the Kerbal system. It's nothing like that. And the reason is, oh, let's just, just pause whilst those beautiful rapier engines activate there. But yeah, the reason for this is because this isn't actually a video I planned to make today. I I did actually have a really fun challenge video that I wanted to get published uh, this week, and that was a, a big epic Duna challenge mission. The challenge was basically one part to Duna. So basically, just a Kerbal sitting on top of a solid rocket booster going to Duna, and I very nearly got it done. But I just couldn't quite get it finished. Like, I just couldn't... I, I didn't realize at the time, but Kerbals, when they're on EVA, can't create maneuver nodes. At least engineer Kerbals can't, because I brought an engineer instead of a pilot. So maybe that was my folly. Not quite sure. Either way, I just for the life of me can't seem to get the mission to... I mean, it's so it's so tantalizingly close, right? The way the mission would have worked is the Kerbal just flies up, straight up on the dumb solid rocket booster, because obviously there's no SAS control for the rocket. And then once kind of the booster runs out, Apoapsis is about halfway to the MUN. We then just use the EVA pack to kind of use the MUN to gravity assist us out into it, planetary space. And then we do a kind of series of Kerbin flybys to gravity assist our way all the way to Juna. And I can get to Juna, but I just, because the actual like EVA pack controls are so finicky and fuel is so tight that I can't quite get my orbital line to intersect Juna's atmosphere. It will either be like, it will be like massively to the side. I tap the D key for like RCS control and it will suddenly swing massively to the other side of the planet. It's way too imprecise so maybe I need to go and just have another go. I don't know. I don't know if I've really got the heart to continue it. It was really frustrating and frankly kind of a boring mission for me to do. There was so much footage and I just can't I just haven't got the emotional energy to go through all the footage and cut out all the quick saves and quick loads because there are a lot of failed attempts at things because 
I couldn't create maneuver nodes, and I had to set up a load of complicated gravity assists. But that was basically the mission I planned to publish today. Uh, and then I had to sort of throw something together on the morning of the video's upload date. Like, it's Saturday for me, which is the day I'm hoping this video goes live. And also, as you can see, I had a bit of a visual glitch. The Rapier engines have entered their closed cycle engine mode, and now we have this sort of solid magenta beam coming from them, which is clearly a glitch. It's obviously a glitch to do with the Waterfall mod, I think. Maybe I've installed the configs wrong, or maybe I've got stock configs instead of restock configs, because of course I'm using the... Well, you, you've probably noticed the litany of visual mods I've currently got installed, but one of those visual mods is Restock, which reskins the stock parts of the game to look a bit nicer. And I do have to issue a formal apology now, like very sincerely. I have been falsely attributing the creator of this mod as Natea, which, you know, Natea did contribute towards that mod, but that's doing a disservice to the fact that it wasn't just Natea. It was actually a huge team of people, and I feel I'm very sorry now. I'm apologising for not giving the, you guys guys credit. So the full restock uh, contributors are Natea obviously, but then there's Andrew Cassidy, Beal, Blowfish, Passing Lurker, Pork Jet, Rio Crockite, Caverick, and Well. So that's the, uh, that's the full list of credits for restock. I apologize for not giving you guys credit when I should have done. That was, that was on me not doing my due diligence when I was researching and installing all the mods that I've been using recently. But yeah, that's the uh, full list of credits of people who made restock. Well, who made restock. As you may have noticed, I have a few other mods installed that improve the visuals of the game. As you can see, Kerbin is looking rather beautiful there underneath us in the map screen. And yeah, I've got uh, Scatterer installed, as well as environmental visual enhancements, stock volumetric clouds, and Blackrack's new deferred rendering mod, Games Links's Parallax 2.0, and Shadow Mage's TUFX mod using Blackrack settings. So yeah, those are all the visual mods that I've currently got installed on this save file. And speaking of visuals, we're about to have a visual on the debris, I think. There, there it is, floating above us. Now, in my uh, haste, like I say, I had to sort of, I had to do this mission rather unplanned and unexpected. This was literally the maiden flight of this SSTO that I sort of threw together without really thinking about it too much. I thought this looks about correctly proportioned for a low curb orbit SSTO, so let's just go ahead and do it. And in my haste, I forgot to add RCS. To the vehicle. So we're gonna have to do some very sort of careful maneuvering using the rapier engine to get nice and close uh, with the hope that we'll just sort of catch the booster out of the sky or you know out of the vacuum of space uh, with that claw that's on an extended uh, hydraulic piston. On my first attempt I got tantalizingly close but not quite die so we have to do another attempt. Don't worry, second attempt did succeed. You're not going to have to watch this for like hours and hours, me attempting to get a close enough pass to the debris that we can catch it. I am playing the footage back four times faster than regular speed at this point, so I was being much more careful than this footage might imply. <laughs> like, it's like I'm going really quickly, but I was going pretty slowly. As you can see, our target velocity, well, velocity relative to the target is only 0.4 meters per second, and here we go. Are we going to get it? Oh, wrong way. There we go. We have captured the debris. Now, before we deorbit it, we're going to get Bill Kerman out on EVA. Bill is an engineer Kerbal, which means that he can do this. Not that, I clutched the wrong tool. He can strut the debris to the fuselage of the spacecraft, just to make it nice and stable. We're then going to use the SSTO to perform the deorbit burn. Now, we don't have a great deal of oxidizer left in the SSTO's fuel tanks, and I was somewhat tempted to transfer some of the oxidizer and, I guess, liquid fuel from the kind of the booster that we're deorbiting now, transferring it into the SSTO's fuel tank so we could get a bit more Delta V for when it comes to our curb and re-entry, because when we detach this booster, we're going to have like less than 20 meters per second to actually perform our burn that's going to get us back to the KSC. But I decided against that because, I don't know, it's it's not, it's kind of adds to the, the challenge of the mission, right? Makes it a bit more fun. And also, I didn't think it'd be that realistic to have the fuel transferring through the claw unit. I guess what I could have done was I could have brought a fuel pipe with me, had Bill come and weld that to the spent stage, and then attach the other end to the SSD and like transfer the fuel that way, but at that point, it, was, it wasn't necessary, essentially. We're going to do our deorbit burn now. Burning retrograde, I think. I think that's it. Yeah, we've now spent all of our oxidizer, and our periapsis is still uh, pretty high. What does that say? 64 uh, just over 64 kilometers, so pretty high periapsis. So we're going to try and create, a, induce as much aerodynamic drag as possible by just pointing the spacecraft straight radially up, just to uh, you know make, basically make ourselves as air brake shaped as possible. 
I then did a little bit of spinning because as we know spinning is a very good trick just kind of create a bit more drag but I decided against to doing that for the main heating of the, the main uh, heat stage of re-entry because it's not really that realistic is it so uh, let's go ahead and just well just do that I guess can't think if there's anything else I needed to mention about this one thing if you are going to make an SSTO that's kind of based on this one you've got to watch your temperature gauges of the air brakes they are very very fragile when it comes to uh, you know heating although I didn't actually get any temperature gauges appear on the air brakes uh, for this descent which is quite unusual I guess they are kind of sheltered by the fuselage of the SSTO but still like I say they are normally very vulnerable to the effects of re-entry heating so uh, I guess I was just lucky on this occasion and now being quite aggressive with our banking because I can see the Kerbal Space Center is directly below us because so we basically need to come to a dead stop and I did sort of make a mistake for some reason the nav ball there is set to orbital velocity you know make our velocity relative to Kerbal in orbit rather than surface which is what you need it set to when you're forming atmospheric flight like this I don't know how or why this happened it just did so it kind of threw me off when I was coming into landing because I didn't realize my velocity was my orbit velocity rather than my surface velocity so I ended up coming in way too slow then way too fast when we touched down we we're going like 110 meters per second according to the nav ball so yeah that's kind of why my uh la that's the excuse I'm using why my landing was a little bit weird like why are we accelerating we're clearly braking I wasn't really sure and then it was only when we touched down that I noticed a little bit of a little bit of a deja vu I've just been in this place before <laughs> uh, then I realized yep yeah, so switch it to surface mode and there we are now now it's actually giving us an accurate reading of how fast we're going so yeah no, oh, that was um that was a I'd like to think that, that was like the cannon was that we had a bit of an equipment failure during our re-entry right we had some sort of malfunction of the uh, telemetry systems so Jeb had to pilot Jeb had to use his raw skills try and pilot without having an accurate speedometer there you go that's my that's my canon explanation uh, for whatever reason this piece of debris didn't continue deorbiting once we got out of physics range of it I assumed it would just get destroyed once the SST was out of physics range because both vehicles were in Kerbin atmosphere at that point but I guess that didn't happen it just teleported itself back to Kirby Norbit so now we can switch to it well we have switched to it so we can make sure that it does actually re-enter and does actually get destroyed and it very nearly hit the Kerbal Space Center actually Kerbal Space Center is on the other side of this mountain here but the mountain it protects the Kerbal Space Center um, for the, on, on this on this occasion and uh, let's get let's just uh, watch that final moment of impact uh. Bit of an anticlimax really but uh yeah thank you for watching this video i'm sorry it was kind of a shorter one and not that big of a challenge but i hope you know it was enjoyable nonetheless real life unfortunately means i can't always bring my a game for videos because if, if, if i'm for a weekly upload schedule so uh, yeah oh by the way planet coaster 2 was announced um and if you think i'm gonna fall for the hype of a sequel of a game i love after ksp2 then you are absolutely correct